this is the man of the champions, Bill Fonte Alfonso, giving a shout out to something else. Something else, Daddy. This is Nicole Vitale, Great Warrior Wolf, and you are listening to Something Else. I'm Tony Cheney, and you're listening to Something Else. Hey everybody, it's Rich Palladino, the voice of New England, and you are listening to Something Else with Aria. <laughs> And welcome to episode number 107 of Something Else. Feast your hair holes on this week's episode as we take a look at NWA Total Nonstop Action number 5 from July 17, 2002. Joining me, as always, is the Don West to my Mike Tanay, it's Cindy. Cindy, how you doing today? I got to tell you, I just sold 10,000 jerk wax boxes. Fleer 90. Dodrus 91. Be dialing people. I'm doing okay. Is it only $19.99? You think it's $19.99, but... With this special offer, we can't do it all day. We can only do it for this hour. Fourteen ninety nine. Oh my God, we're gonna lose money on that selling it for fourteen ninety nine. They told us to get rid of it. We're gonna get rid of it. Wow, they're just getting rid of it. And they're just getting rid of it. So, welcome to week five of the TNA reviews. Somehow we've made it a month. And somehow we're going to keep going. I, th- I think at this point it's out of spite that we're just not going to stop. No, because I, know we, I think both of us know that good stuff is coming up. The, like the sad thing is there is some good stuff mixed in with the crap, but there is so much crap that it's like it makes it hard sometimes to enjoy the good stuff. Yeah. But anywho... Um, we try to tell you what uh, Jerry Jarrett reports in his book every week. Um, the big news this week is that Jerry Jarrett is speaking to his lawyers about what legal action they can take against Jay Hossman for his fraudulent pay-per-view reports. And the, you know, this is TNA moment. Jay was using TNA money to purchase commercial time in Iowa, a state which doesn't have a pay-per-view provider that airs the show. Then what was he? What was he promoting? Uh, the idea of TNA. I'm sure that the fine folks in Ottumwa, Iowa, are going to enjoy the festivities of TNA. Oh, I, I'm sure they would have if they would have had the chance to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So. Um, they're still at the Nashville Municipal Auditorium. Uh, this is the last week before they jump over to the fairgrounds. Um, but uh, yeah, they're still in this big ass ten thousand seat arena, and they are not coming anywhere close to filling it. And if I was Cindy, I'm sure she would say, "You're right, Arya. They didn't come anywhere close to filling it." No, like. Like the Nashville Municipal Auditorium was what fourth that like I only saw what maybe like two thousand three thousand maybe and to get to that you know they were heavily papered. I think we've realized a flaw. Yes, nobody on the planet Earth wants to pay to watch this company. Nobody. Uh, so. Might as well dive right in here. It's July 17th, 2002. The way you can keep up with what day the show is, it's the day the show drops, minus 22 years. So you're listening to this on July 17th, 2024. Shockingly, we're watching the July 17th, 2002 episode. 
it's amazing how that works. It's magic, folks. I, I don't know how she does it. Do you believe in magic? Ooh, in the young girl's heart. All right. So speaking of singing, Goldilocks uh, kicks off the show, stalking NWA World Heavyweight Champion Ken Shamrock. No, that's not the start. What's there the was start? a big the promo package at the start of Jarrett causing chaos the past few weeks. Well, taking out Scott Hall, Ken Shamrock, the Tennessee Titans, Officer Bar Brady, Chef, Uncle Jimbo, the 1991 Denver Broncos. Hey, I, I have to say something. Jeff Jarrett did not take out the Tennessee Titans. The Tennessee Titans did a hell of a job taking him out, and Malice had to save his life last week. Yeah. Um, so after that, uh, Goldilocks approaches the world heavyweight champion who yells at her to back off, bitch. <laughs> Ken, I had that line written too. Ken, by the way, Ken Shamrock is a baby face. Goldilocks is a baby face commentator. And this is how you talk in Vince Russo's America to women. And he threatened to kick the shit out of everybody. A great start to the show. And it is also the only appearance by the world heavyweight champion that we'll see on tonight's show. Oh, don't From... worry. He's all over episode six, so don't worry about that. Yes. Well, d don't get too used to him because uh, he's gone in three weeks. Spoiler, Spoiler. alert. Yeah. Yes. Um, today announces that tonight we're going to have a ladder match. Our first ever TNA ladder match. The first of about six bajillion. Jeff Jarrett versus Malice. That sounds like a tremendous ladder match. And Objection! Yes? You see, they think that it's Jeff Jarrett versus Malice, but I have this shocking piece of evidence as evidenced by my flowing hair. A wild Scott Hall appears. Yes. Scott Hall attacks Jeff Jarrett. I, 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 I want to reiterate this here. Scott Hall attacks Jeff Jarrett backstage. Jarrett defends himself and kicks Hall's ass. Security breaks it up and Bill Barons runs in to tell Jarrett that he's now forfeited his match and is being taken out of the building. So Jeff Jarrett got attacked and he and his punishment for being attacked is to be taken out of the number one contenders match. TNA, TNA, TNA. Jeff Jarrett, like, I, I can't imagine Jerry Jarrett thought that this was getting his boy over as a heel. Because he is getting fucked ten ways from sideways on this show. Yeah. And it gets worse in a few weeks. Just wait. So, anyway, Jarrett gets dry kicking and screaming out of the building. And we go to the announcers where Mike Tanay with a straight face, calls Don West the zoot suit daddy. Did you see that suit? Oh, it was tremendous. Don't get me wrong. Freddie Blassie was smiling in heaven and he wasn't dead yet. I was going to say, I thought he was still alive for another year. Uh, so the new church, led by Father James Mitchell, wandered to the ring while Mike Tanay try to figure out, or tries to figure out what the hell is going on. Uh, Mitchell takes the mic and says, even though Jarrett will not be here to bleed, Malice still wishes to kick someone's ass and issues an open challenge. The lights go out. Not sure whose job it is to, play the, to pay the light bills, but we need to fix that here. Well, lights... seeing as how the guy seemingly stiffed uh, TNA and screwed him over with the money, they probably couldn't afford the bill. <laughs> so I guess they found some change. They were able to keep the lights on for the week. And when they come up... It's Sabu. Deal. Yep. Sabu. Well, I got to say, thankfully, Sabu just happened to be, you know, backstage, you know, hoping that, you know, something would happen where he could uh, insert himself into a match this week. 
Um, apparently, Tanay said that he was already planned to have a match later on in the show. Oh, oh of course. So I'm gonna. So we get Malice versus Sabu in a ladder match, and this sounds like the greatest pile of shit you've ever seen in your life. I like this match. I did too. Um, before we get into it, I could, I'll, I could confidently say that this match was completely last minute planned because. All throughout the match, you know, they hyped up uh, Tempest being a new mm-hmm. member of the new church uh, last week. Yep. He really comes into play this week. He's audibly telling Sabu and Malice what to do. I, I, I noted that every time Tempest interferes, he's caught on camera whispering the next spot to Sabu. And Malice. I honestly didn't see him do it to Malice, but I'll take your word for it. But this was a fun little weapons match where a ladder was also involved. Um, Sabu was bleeding from the nose, which Don West wondered how Sabu can see with all this blood. And thankfully, gravity works as well for Sabu as everybody else because the blood coming out of your nose did not go into Sabu's eyes. But uh, we had a bit of a creative spot here that I wrote as Malice inside the ring threw Sabu into the ladder and then picks up both Sabu and the ladder in a body slam and slammed them both down. And I was impressed Malice got his hands out of the way, first of all. because That was a great spot. Yes. Uh, by the way, like, you know, we're taping this the same night as Money in the Bank, and I didn't watch the show, but I imagine, like, with most 21st century ladder matches, they start trying to climb the ladder 30 seconds in. That just seems to be what it is. The match was more than half over by the time either of them started to climb the ladder. Right. Um, Sabu tried to climb. Malice, who was almost taller than the ladder, power bombed him off of it, which... Uh, then led to Malice giving Sabu a belly-to-belly overhead suplex into the ladder, which led to what I wrote down, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I wrote down as the first-ever TNA chant heard on screen. Yep. Yeah. Um, I thought it was ECW a little bit, but I'll take your word for it that it was TNA. I took, I heard TNA, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, maybe I heard what I wanted to and I wanted to believe that uh, this was uh, TNA and not ECW. Uh, Sabu tapped Malice in the head with a chair twice, and I'll call that a win because, you know, you know, trying to keep people from getting head trauma. Uh, the finish saw Malice climb the ladder, but Sabu pushed it over and then climbed up and got the contract for the win. Um, and then Malice went crashing through the table outside the ring and he got pushed off. So Sabu is now going to get a title match with Ken Shamrock. Next week. Yes. And we'll, we'll get into the stipulations of that match later on. Oh, boy. But I, I said this was the best non-X Division match we've seen so far. And yep. I, give, I give it a rating of a 5.5 out of 10. I think I need to explain to the listening audience. Uh, I My scale is just a traditional... Zero through ten. Mm-hmm. Um, You're not going point five and point three and no, because um, that you know the star rating stuff and that's just too much math. It's complicated. It's like algebra. Why did I use letters or something? I I was great at that. Algebra was my subject in uh, junior high. I did well in algebra too, but I'm too old for it now. Uh, so I just give it a 7 out of 10. Nice. Um, so the new church attacks after the bell. Sabu fights back, but the trio of evil was too much for him. Uh, Tempest and Slash set up the table outside the ring, and Malice chokeslams Sabu off the apron and through the table. It's nice to see that the new top contender uh, immediately got his win rendered meaningless by getting his ass kicked by three people. 
Um, a flash flood happened outside because <laughs> um, Jeff Jarrett was soaking wet, and so was everybody else. And Bill Barron's called Jarrett a bastard. Hey, asshole, Jerry Jarrett was happily married. Read his book. I'm guessing so, Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. Um, hey, Jerry. Hey, Jerry Lee comes out for a promo. Actually, AJ Styles came out for a promo. While Sabu was being attended to still, by the way. Yeah. Uh, AJ comes out and demands an explanation for why Jerry Lynn beat his ass last week. And Jerry Lynn, who who I who knows who the fucking heel and who the fucking face is here, it honestly, like, you can't even keep track of it. But I've Jerry Lynn given up. Yeah. Jer, Jerry Lynn says he's been busting his ass for 14 years and he won't put up with AJ walking around like King shit because he's had some success in the past month, not pointing out the King shit beat him, you know, twice in one night. Uh, Lynn says that AJ didn't do him a favor. Uh, Lynn gave him an opportunity and is tired of AJ being a glory hound. And, of course, AJ sells that he's choked up and he understands. Lynn screams that AJ will respect him. And, again, the whole point of this is Jerry is mad that during their tag team title match last week, AJ Styles won the match instead of him. Um, so when Jerry got done talking, being the stupid baby face that he is, or stupid heel, or stupid whatever he is, he turns his back to AJ, and AJ kicks his ass and lays him out with a Styles flash. And the cosmic ballet goes on. We, okay, we need a. I was going to say we should start a running count on how many times this happens in TNA. But you know what? It, the counter would break by week eight, so forget it. Indeed. Um, I'm not even saying any of this was good, but the announcers wouldn't shut the fuck up talking over the promo and filling in every second of silence. Which That is a bad habit that TNA had and still does. They don't really have that habit nowadays with Hannah Fan and Ray Walt. It pops up sometimes, but not as bad as it was early on. Like, I think what they were trying to do was uh, something that was completely different from the uh, WWE style, which is, was like, not like this was during the time where you had the TNA promos, the uh, Triple H promos from hell. Tonight, uh, I am the game. Uh, and yes, a- apparently, uh, um, Triple H was really mad at Brian Gilberts for pointing out that he says uh a lot. Did Brian Gilberts say that in his book? Yes. By the way, Brian Gilberts, the same person who said that Cody Rhodes ruined the WrestleMania storyline because he wasn't enthusiastic enough about giving up his WrestleMania title match. I, I'm still trying to figure out how, like, even if Cody wasn't disappointed by the whole thing, how the hell was he supposed to act happy and enthusiastic that he wasn't going to get his title match? Anyway. I'm so, just glad that, you know, sanity reign supreme but eric young killian dane and uh whoever else was in that group got fired actually nikki crossed it and she's still around backstage we uh have an interview with jasmine st Clair and francine jumps her woo yes she throws her into the showers and turns them on this was fucking awful and they cut away before you could really figure out what the hell happened can we get some actual? Yeah, now now we get money. All right. So this is one of those times where it's like, in the middle of all the bullshit, you get you know, the makings of a star because K Crush comes out, and I'm not even saying this segment's that great, but K Crush is like 
one of the few major league things on this show. Um, there is a white guy in the third row flipping him off, but uh, he stands in the ring and he wonders why he's not the biggest star in the history of wrestling and why he's stuck wrestling NASCAR guys. And then he talks about how, you know, you see, because this is a shoot, the fake wrestling script booked him in a match with the NASCAR driver. And then he starts the second feud in company history between a TNA wrestler and WWE. But this time it was with the entire company as he's pissed off that they didn't push him and then they released him. And Crush said he's afraid that everyone is afraid of him being better than everybody else. And from this point on, he's going to take what's supposed to be his. He will spit in everyone else's face for doing it. He is not an angry black man. He is the truth. And the truth will not be denied. Money line. Yes. Indeed. They are changing his name like in the next couple weeks. If you can't figure it out. So that leads us to K Crush versus Norman Smiley. Now, before the match, Mike Tanay shills the Pro Wrestling Torch and the Wrestling Observer for their positive reports of last week's pay-per-view. I, I'm sure that, you have those back issues, and uh, I am looking forward to hearing what the research you have. I actually didn't even bother to look it up. Oh. <laughs> I, I guess I could hear while we're talking here, but... Uh, you do that, know- I'll talk about the match. If you right want, on. if you want to do that, I can take over this match. Sure. Um, K. Crush versus Norman Smiley was a thing that happened. Um, it is your basic. It's essentially your basic heat match or Saturday night match. Like Norman is the journeyman who plays all of his hits, like uh, the smack my bitch up, the wiggle, everything, and you smack it, my bitch up. That's when he, you know, the, uh, you know, the, it's the big wiggle, but that's another term for it. Okay. I'll, I'll take your word for it. Um, but K Crush gets back into it quickly as the star ought to do. Mm-hmm. And Norman has him on his knees and then decides to go for a hip attack. Uh, that pissed off K Crush. He goes berserk and hits a front suplex for the win. I think that was like his truth detector, or like uh, I think that's a variation of his truth detector, mm-hmm. or something along those lines. Um, then after he wins the match, uh, he takes off his belt and decides to whip Norman Smiley with it. Um, and then he proceeds to have the belt around his neck and throws him over the top through the middle ropes and tries to hang him. Norman's actual wife comes out. Was that his actual wife? That's his actual wife, yes. I just kind of, like, assumed it was one of those stupid, uh, you know, uh, wrestling things. It's like, oh, the large white woman is really Norman Smiley's wife. I believe that's his actual wife. Um, Tries to get K-Crush to stop it, manages to pull him away, and then K-Crush goes after her, and then security comes and breaks it up. So, uh, Dave did like this show. Uh, 710 pay-per-view is easily the best of the four shows. First off, Jerry Jarrett is a damn good booker, but the show still lives and dies with talent. And uh, this show, they book some good talent. Um, the show, 85% of the show is written by Jarrett before Russo was even hired. Let me see. Do we remember anything really bad about last week that I could see what he said about? Um, episode four. Yeah. I think I might have lost those notes. Uh, well, um, here, here's the uh, NASCAR match. K Crush, who was freaking awesome, did a great heat getting promo, then got DQ'd against race car driver Hermie Sadler in 505. 
Crush carried him as well as possible. Sadly, it was bad, but I've seen worse. Like on Raw Monday with Jackie Gata and Trish Stratus, because that's when this was happening. Oh, that was the week that match happened? Yes. Wow. Suddenly, you know. Uh, and it was one star. Uh, let's see. I'd have to assume that Jackie Gata match got minus three stars. Oh, more more than likely. It's not uh, you know, more than that here. Uh, by the way, Ken Shamrock was supposed to beat Amora Amori last week, but Noah told uh, them they that Amori couldn't do a job. So that yeah. explains the screwy finish. Yes. No, no, no idea about the uh, you know, the Alicia shit that, by the way, is just going to end very shortly. Uh, it has ended. She's not on the show. Oh, was she? I honestly, it's like I. There's so much shit that happens on these shows that I don't even, you know, remember. And by the way, the week of this observer was the week that Bischoff debuted in WWE. Oh. So I got, so I got to go back a week to find Dave's report on the Jackie Gatum. Well, uh, we can move on because, well, actually, we are just gonna. Oh God, this segment. By the way, I gave it a, a one point five out of ten. The, uh, I gave it a three out of ten. You were liking these matches more than I am, even though I'm still complimenting them. It's just, you know, it is what it is. Well, maybe I should explain that my rating system is kind of more traditional. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not an observer, Hall of Fame, year-end awards voter. I don't do star rankings or anything like that. Like, now there's seven stars, so, like, every star... It used to be two, now it's, like, a point and a half (laughs) or something along those lines. So, whatever. Uh, can we talk about the worst fucking thing that TNA has ever done so far? That's in two weeks. Oh, on this show. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. So, Goldilocks goes backstage. And she is roaming around. And she comes upon puppets who you might recall is a little person. His gimmick is that he's a midget killer Mm -hmm. and he is in a garbage can and he is masturbating. I said in my notes, it's like Goldilocks interview a puppet and that moment hits. No, not that one with the something that we'll talk about in episode seven. The one with the trash can. Yes. This is one of those, like, those famous moments that, like, nobody really saw because, like, people were not buying these shows. But, like, everybody knows it happened. And it's like, what the hell was even the point of this? The guy is masturbating in a trash can. And he says he has PMS, pissed midget syndrome. Good lord, I'm going to step away for a bit. Continue on talking about this backstage segment. Have fun. It it, it keeps going because we we can't just let it end with Puppet. Legitimately, by the way, Goldilocks, who is perhaps the most professional person on this show, literally says that once her singing career takes off, she's gone. Great. Honestly, I would bury her for saying that, but at this point, I hope her fucking singing career takes off soon because, you know, she deserves a lot better than this shit. Goldilocks continues to walk along the backstage area and finds the Duffs playing Spin the Bottle and playing with fire. And then Stan, who you might recall is Trevor Murdoch, former NWA World Heavyweight Champion or future NWA World Heavyweight Champion, talked about her pretty lips and was talking about her vagina when he said that. I doubt Jerry Jarrett booked this segment. I don't... Nothing about Jerry Jarrett makes me think that he booked a segment with, you know, a little person masturbating in a trash can and then the inbred hillbilly talking about uh, you know, the ring announcer's vagina. And I guess she's not the ring announcer, but the backstage interview's vagina. 
Yeah. This was a real thing that happened. Ugh. Any any thoughts on this fine, fine segment that aired on this program? I have food. Okay, then. Cindy has food. And by the way, Cindy has food. And I have uh, Dave's report on that Jackie Gata match. Um, Str- Trish Stratus and Bradshaw beat Jackie Gata and Chris Nowinski in the longest three minutes and 14 seconds in pro wrestling history. Stratus and Gata did a spot early that was the single most messed up high spot in pro wrestling history. After watching it back several times, I still have no clue what it was supposed to be. Bradshaw and Nowinski brawled into the crowd. I think they were running out as fast as they could to preserve whatever reputation they have left. Ross made it clear that Gator was a green rookie, even using the bowling shoe reference as the match fell apart, and when it was over, said it was a merciful ending. Finish saw Stratus try a bulldog off the top, which missed badly. Gata did the dreaded delay sell of a missed move. Gata was lost, and everybody in the building suddenly saw that she had no business on Raw. Uh, She was smart enough to know that the spot was blown and shouldn't be the finish, so she kicked out of the pin. The ref and Trish blew it off by not figuring out something so obvious, and the ref counted three anyway, which only made things worse. And he actually did not give it a... uh, a star rating. Wow. I think that's an even bigger indictment on that match. Yeah. And this was the same night that did the 10 man tag with Kevin Nash tore his quadricep walking across the ring. That is a cursed episode of Raw. Yes. And, and uh, by the way, the match that immediately followed uh, that Jackie Gata match Ric Flair versus Stevie Richards. Are you sure this was Raw or not Heat? <laughs> It was raw. It was raw. Uh, oh, and Jeff Hardy won the European title from William Regal on this show. Oh, well, we have a positive moment. Yes. If the uh, main event, Kevin Nash, X-Pac, Big Show, Benoit, and Guerrero beating Booker T, Goldust, Dudleys, and Rob Van Dam in 925. Real good match, but the crowd was hating the show by this point. Um uh, and uh, Lesnar came out, gave Van Dam an F5 on the ramp. Then Nash got hurt, and the thing fell apart. All right. Apparently, so, the story for that is that Nash forgot his brace. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. Disco. Yep. Um, went to got him his brace, and it. And then when Nash's for his ACL or quad. It was his other one. And, the good and, leg that popped. And by the way, this was Nash's first match back after injury. Like he was out, I think it was with a bicep tear, maybe. But like yeah, he, he was, was out for a couple of months. Yeah, I think he only had like two matches but and then he got hurt. Then he came back to this and oh boy. This poor motherfucker, you know. Well, and then came back and had a nothing feud with Triple H. Like tri- Triple H is two thousand three. Scott Steiner, Kevin Nash, and Goldberg. And this was when he decided that all world title matches need to have some time, and not apparently realizing that Scott Steiner, Kevin Nash, and Bill Goldberg should not be doing twenty minute matches. You're forgetting about Booker T. Honestly, I just... Yeah, I honestly forgot about it for a second. But yeah, he had that Booker T match at WrestleMania where he pedigrees Booker and then 90 seconds later pins him. And that was after he did the promo talking about how Booker's people didn't win world titles. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Suddenly, a match that looked better on paper than it was is so much better. The Flying Elvis Impersonators versus Christopher Daniels and Elix Skipper. So, yeah. So, Sonny Siaki and Jerry Estrada are the uh, 
or not Jerry Estrada, Jorge Estrada. Why did I write? Mm-hmm. I think Jerry Estrada was a, a luchador, wasn't he? Yeah. But yeah, so I wrote Jerry. It's actually Jorge. Where the Elvises, because Jimmy Yang's in Japan, and uh, which last is true, week, he was working for Noah. Yeah, that was all Japan, but maybe it was Noah. Oh, you're right, all Japan. But uh, last week, uh, you know, they had the six man X division match, and the Elvises attacked Elix Skipper, Loki, and Chris Daniels because even though they've been undefeated, they weren't involved in the X division title number one contender match. Um, so here we are with what is technically the start of Triple X, even though it really isn't. Daniels and Skipper. So Siaki just joins the announce table. He takes a tornado drive from dive from Skipper, but he just joins the announce table. And they forgot to turn uh Siaki's mic on. Um, and then as soon as they do, we were just listening to Siaki breathe heavily into the mic. Mm-hmm. Um and I mean, this was essentially a two-on-one handicap match here uh, for a little while. Um, and then Siaki eventually re-enters the ring in time for a four-way. Uh, Skipper tried a move where he stepped off Daniel's back, landed on Estrada's shoulders, and jumped off of the Hurricanrana to Siaki. And shockingly, the only part that got messed up was the Hurricanrana. Because that just was a fucked-up thing waiting to happen. Somehow, the hard parts went smoothly. Right. Um, I wrote that Siaki got the heat on Daniels, even though I'm pretty sure none of them are baby faces. Uh, Skipper gets the theoretical hot tag and uses the double underhook to play to Siaki, but was pretty much lifting Siaki's shoulders off the mat. Asharada tried to do a springboard senton, but landed on his right foot and then rolled over. Uh, Daniels hit the best moonsault ever for a two count. Siaki, uh, well, I have to. I don't know who he actually gave this to because I wrote Saki gave Estrada a pump handle slam, but I'm pretty sure he did give it to him. He gave it to Skipper. Okay. Uh, then Skipper then hits the play of the day, but was pinned by Siaki after a roll of the dice, which was called the money clip. Daniels kept this match together, I wrote, but even he could only perform so many miracles. I just want to comment on something about this match, and it's kind of been bugging me about wrestling for the past year and a half now. Okay. It was a fine match, but I was distracted by a dumbass named Chad. If you watch in the background during this match, he was all in the background of his sign saying, Hi, my name is Chad, when the match was on the hard camera. I did not notice Chad. And I was going to ask if you met the last year and a half, meaning the last year and a half in 2002. Or in 2024. 2022 to 2024. Because this is becoming a trend in wrestling. It's kind of infuriating me. Like, everybody is trying... When you bring a sign to the audience, you you raise it once or twice, that's fine. But a lot of the times, a lot of people are trying to become memes. Like, a meme has to happen naturally. and needs to be caught perfectly. Ms. Girl, for example. Yes is a perfect example of a meme that works. Angry Ms. Girl, I can guarantee, did not make that face because she knew she was going to be on camera in five seconds. No. Um, The punk is Jeff Hardy kid when he was looking all, you know, like, not impressed. Mm-hmm. Like, those, those things. Um... I'll go as far as say uh, Lesnar guy. Shocked Lesnar, uh, shock taker fan at Mania 30. So I wasn't when sure Lesnar if he meant, if yeah. he meant uh, Brock Lesnar guy who did the Brock Lesnar dance when he came back in 2012 or shocked Undertaker guy at WrestleMania 30. Shock, both, both are, you know, both are valid. You know, yeah. th- those happen naturally. Like, people are forcing stuff nowadays, and it's annoying, and it's taken away from the action in the ring. Same thing with this match with that dumbass fan, and then we have other people joining him. See, I I was hoping when you said that they were shocked by Chad, they were watching the short-lived TBS sitcom from a few years ago. That was a fun show. Apparently, a season two was was taped. 
It was. And then they canceled TBS canceled the show the day season two was supposed to start. I'm trying and, to figure out what network is airing it now. I think it's Amazon or something they have season two. I, I know it's streaming somewhere. I never I haven't actually watched season two. I may have to, but yeah. I was so pissed off because I like that show too. You know, and this was when TBS was canceling all their scripted shows. And okay, fine, you're canceling it, but you've already paid to produce it. That's what drove me crazy. Like, just put it on the air at that point. But oh well. I gave the Smash, by the way, a three. I gave it a five. Remember, my yeah. I'm more lenient than you are. Uh, Post match, the dups come out because we can't have enough of the dups, and they it's literally ha- lay lumber on Jorge Estrada. Asiaki yep. bails. Why did this happen? Why do we need a post match beatdown after every match? Who knows? Tio, who is another one of the little people. Were, was dancing in one of the cages wearing a Michael Jordan Washington Wizards jersey. We go to the back where Goldilocks, the most seen person on the roster, was being threatened by Kay Crush, who calls her a bitch. That's the second time on the show she's been called a bitch. Uh, now that heel turn in 2004 makes complete sense. Oh, yeah. Um, Scott Hall comes up and slams Crush into the wall. And he said there was only one person left. Now, was that all it took to take out each person? Like, you know. And then Ed Ferrara points out that when Jeff Jarrett got attacked, he got thrown out of the building. But Scott Hall, the babyface, has free reign to walk around and attack people. It makes no sense. No. No, it doesn't. And up next, is, uh, uh, up next is a match that may still be going on uh, to this day. It's Puppet versus Meatball. So hopefully Puppet washed his hands after jerking off in the trash can earlier. But um, he is here to wrestle the man who is called the world's largest midget. I'm not sure what the qualifications for such a uh, name is. But when, because like, when do you stop being a little person and start being a full size adult? I but, think it's because of height. Like, he was under four foot four. All right. Um, but anyway, he weighs 250 pounds, give or take. But um, so Puppet's nickname and his gimmick is he's the midget killer. And so Tanay asked, yes, Mike Tanay, the lead announcer, asked, if Puppet will commit suicide after he kills all the midgets. Thanks, Mike. Um, a profound question. Puppet uh, did a cartwheel on the ramp, which may have been the most impressive thing we've seen on the show. Just because, no, that was uh, Meatball who did the cartwheel. I'm sorry, yes, it was Meatball. I'm, I, I had the right person in my head. I just said the wrong Meatball does a cartwheel, which may be more impressive than any flip the X Division has ever done. And I mean, up to now in 2024. Um, They hit each other with food, including Puppet hitting Meatball with a watermelon. Puppet tries to do an Irish whip to his very fat opponent into the ring steps. But Meatball trips over his own two feet and rolls into the steps. Um... Back in the ring, Puppet comes off the middle rope with a leg drop and then a Vader bomb for the win. Don't care. Two out of ten. 0. 0.5 out of ten. We kind of agree. Yeah. Remember when I said Malice versus Sabu was the best non exhibition mm-hmm. match so far? I still mean it. And somehow, there was not a post-match angle here. I mean... At least the post-match angle involving them because T.O. was still dancing with uh, one of the dancers and then ripped her shirt off and ran away. And Ed Ferrer was like, I want to hang out with you. Yes. Then, because we didn't have enough boobs there, because, you know, she covered up, 
Jasmine St. Clair with her nipples poking out of her still wet shirt versus Francine. Slick Johnson, the referee, and Jeremy Borash fight each other over who gets to hold the ropes open for Jasmine. Francine skips to the ring and we have a cat fight. Slick Johnson doing his job is uh, down and making sure neither woman taps out or has her shoulders down. Francine has her top ripped off, and Francine was in the fight of her life to keep Jasmine from ripping her bra off. Uh, Francine then rips off Jasmine's shorts. The fans, being classy, take out dollar bills and offer them up, wow. which, bring, which brings out the Blue Meanie, who is still Jasmine St. Clair's boyfriend at this point, and he DDTs Francine. And thus, he carries off Jasmine instead of having Jasmine pin her. And thus, we have a no contest. We could not have a winner in this match between Francine and Jasmine St. Clair. Apparently, Francine got injured. Like, on the DDT? Yeah. I closed out the Observer, so I didn't bother to check to see what Dave rated this match. I'm sure it was four and a half stars. Can we both agree point two out of ten? I gave a zero. Okay, I'll go over that zero out of ten. This match sucked. Yeah. The EMT strap Francine to a board to carry her off. Ed Farrar runs into the ring to help. Not sure how the hell he could help, since actual paramedics were helping. But Don Weston says, you know, this is serious because Ed wasn't trying to take advantage of her. Holy fuck. Don's paying attention. And then Ed Ferrara later on used his Owen Hart voice while talking about this. Wow. I, I'm confident that this is the last time we're ever going to see Francine, at least until they do the ECW reunion show in a decade. Yeah, I think this is this is also the last time we'll see Jasmine St. Clair as well. Ever. Mm -hmm. Possibly ever in the professional wrestling business, because I don't know if 3PW is still a thing, but... Um, 3PW, I think, close... Look, let's look, talk about the next uh, match, which is a pretty good match, Loki versus AJ. I'll look at 3PW. So I was going to talk about a Goldilocks and her fifth appearance tonight, I think changed her top, and tried to interview Loki, who blew her off. So let it be known, in all of her interviews, the only person who actually seemed excited to talk to her was Puppet, who was masturbating in the trash can. And I guess the dubs, but, you know. So let's talk about some positive shit. It took an hour and a half, but we finally got something good. Before the main event, Tanae showed us a video breaking down AJ Styles and Loki's signature moves. This was the best thing on the show so far. So, X Division Champion AJ Styles versus Low Key. I wrote there are more than 30 minutes left in this show, and this is the promoted main event, and I will bet you a body part that I don't want to have that this match will not go 30 minutes. Um, so, remember the Kanakavashi Samoa Joe match in ROH? and how they had the now-legendary Chop Fest. Well, mm -hmm. AJ, AJ and Loki had their own idea, but it involved them kicking each other instead, which was still fun to watch. Not as fun, though, as a fan being thrown out of the building right on camera. Not sure why. But legitimately, the entire crowd had their back turned and watched whatever the hell is happening. Um, Key goes for the cartwheel kick, but AJ drops him mid-cartwheel with a low drop kick. Speaking of Ring of Honor, they get a plug because Tanae mentioned that the winner will defend his title on the next ROH show on July 22nd. And if you're a pro wrestling junkie that are um, like myself, that already tells you who's going to win this match since that's the show they uh, crown the first ROH champion. And spoiler alert, the TNA X Division title was not on the line in the ROH World Title match. Um, so this was just really really good but it only goes 11 minutes but uh, we get a great series of reversals and misses culminating in styles missing a spiral tap 
Uh, but then Key goes for a Key Crusher 99, but AJ turns that into a DDT. Key finally nails the cartwheel kick as another fan gets thrown out. What the hell was in the water in Nashville that night? And actually, I find out later it wasn't even a second fan. The first fan that got thrown out walked right back into the building and got thrown right back out. Wow. Great job by security. Um, well, if you look at him during the show, they get beat up a lot. Yeah. The finish saw Loki go for a flipping, twisting her Karana, but AJ blocks it, nails the style splash, and picks up the win. Um, this was really good, but A, it goes 11 minutes, not 30. B, the stupid fan being thrown out, distracting everybody. And C, we'll see them do a lot better in the future. And I give that match a 6.0 out of 10. Give it a 7 out of 10. So we had one match end without a post-match attack, but we can't have two. Nope. Jerry Lynn attacks AJ Styles on the ramp, threw him in the ring, and dropped him with a cradle pile driver. And then he threw him into a ladder set up in the ring. Why was there a ladder in the ring? Who knows? It's not important. Um, and then Wes says that they will do a match together next week. And what he meant was they're going to have a tag team title defense next week. Yeah. Um, but unlike oh, the rest of the beatdowns on this show, this one made the most sense. Because at least, you know, Lynn, you know, he got his ass kicked by AJ at the beginning of the show, but Lynn kicked AJ's ass the last week. He could have had that be the end of Jerry Lynn this week and moved on with our lives. But nope, we can't just let a really good match sit and be a really good match. So I wrote that they're setting up a ladder match with them, right? Well, there is a ladder match next week, but it's not AJ Styles and Jerry Lynn. It's not Loki. It's not anybody you would immediately think. Next week, in a ladder match, it is Ken Shamrock versus Sabu for the NWA title where the only way you can win is by either climbing the ladder and getting the title or via submission. Who the fuck wants to see that? Um, it's a uh, spoiler alert for everybody who's listening to this right now. It's much worse than we're letting on. Stabu does not have a miracle two weeks in a row. We'll say that. And then a match that I didn't even know was happening. Maybe I missed them promoting it. Do you remember them saying that there'd be Scott Hall versus Brian Waller on this show? Yeah, they hyped it up last week. Remember when Scott Hall phoned in? Okay, but did they ever mention it during this show? Yeah, they talked about it at the beginning. Did they? Yeah, when Scott Hall was beating up Jeff Jarrett. Well, I was too busy being... uh you know, losing my mind over uh, Jeff Jarrett getting fucked over here. Hey, who can blame so, you? So Brian Lawler comes out and he's getting cheered. Um, so because he's getting cheered and he's a heel, he refuses to dance, which, you know, at least in theory is a good heel move. He takes the mic and tells these fans to not call him Jerry's kid, which is good because they weren't doing that. Um, he then tells them to sit down and shut up, which has never worked before. Now and they start he... calling him Jerry's kid. Yes. Because now he starts talking about his daddy. He points out that his daddy was married three times to three women who were all younger than he was. And I then ask the obvious question, how was Jerry Lawler married to a woman? Uh, how was Jerry Lawler married to Brian Christopher's mother if Brian Christopher's mother was younger than him? Um, I don't know. It's the South. It's best to not ask those questions. Yeah. Brian said he also left the ticket for Daddy to come watch the son wrestle, but he didn't because he's at the local high school picking up underage girls with candy. Didn't... Hold on. Rewind. Didn't Doug Gilbert try this back in 97? Except he was a lot more... Uh... Uh, you know, he just flat out said it, like, you know, but yeah. If that's not bad enough, by the way, in case, you know, 
him saying that his dad is at the local high school picking up underage girls with candy. Ed Ferrara asked what kind of candy works. Oh, God, I forgot about that. So whether or not he actually meant to say this, because maybe he just wasn't thinking, Ed Ferrara basically just admitted to being a pedophile here on national pay-per-view. But again, they are building a feud that can never pay off. And then it gets better. So Scott Hall's music plays, and Brian Lawler looks towards the ramp, and he's ready to fight. And Scott Hall sneaks through the crowd to walk to the ring. No, I'm I'm serious when I say that. Scott Hall tiptoed through the crowd to sneak up on Brian Lawler to start the match. Lawler was not getting a cue, so he spent two minutes insulting Hall and challenging the crowd to get into the ring with him while Hall stood behind him waiting for him to turn around. This was and, so dumb, but so hilarious at the same time. Yeah. The crowd wasn't pointing at Hall, and the referee wasn't in front of Lawler to give him the Iggy. So he just kept going. Because I think like Lawler's like, well, I'm not going to turn around and blow the spot. Because like someone's eventually, like either Hall's going to tap me in the shoulder, or the referee's going to give me a sign, or Borash is going to do something or whatever. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. This went on for two minutes. And eventually Lawler was like, okay, I, I think... You know, the guy has to be in the fucking ring by this point. And he turns around, and sure enough, Scott Hall's there, and the match is finally on. And the way the match was starting, I was wishing that they would continue playing a game of where's Scott Hall. Hall throws a punch at Lawler that missed by 10 feet that Lawler was supposed to go through the ropes to the floor, so Lawler half-sold it and just walked between the ropes. Um... Lawler then grabs someone's purse and and smacks Scott with it. And uh, Brian Lawler does the big boss man baseball slide punch to the face thing with Scott Hall draped across the middle rope. Uh, he then grabs the mic and tells all the fans calling him Jerry's kid to kiss his ass. Lawler goes up top for the hip hop drop, but Hall tosses him off. He hits the fall away slam and places him on the top rope, hitting his back suplex off the top rope that I don't think he ever did in WCW. He goes for the outsider's edge, but K-Crush, who's supposed to hit the ring, missed his cue, so Hall keeps looking to the back until Crush finally runs in. Not even sure what the point of it was, since Hall punked out K-Crush and pinned Lawler after an outsider's edge. And I wrote, Hall standing behind Lawler before the match was the best part of the match. Yep, by a country mile. And I gave it what could be a generous 2.5 out of 10. 4 out of 10. After the match, K-Crush runs back in. Hall goes for another edge, but Lawler hit him with a low blow. So the heels now double-team Hall with the same belt that K-Crush used on Norman Smiley earlier. Continuity. At least there's some continuity with the post-match beatdowns. Yes. Crush chokes Hall with the belt while security and Don or Ron Harris break it up. And for the second time in three weeks, Scott Hall gets taken off on a stretcher. Jeff Jarrett, who doesn't understand what a week off means, then ends the show by showing up and beating up Hall on the stretcher for the second time in three weeks. Uh, Jarrett then hits a dozen people in the head with chair shots and threatens the camera as the show fades to black. And I should note that Jarrett was dressed like an EMT, meaning his plot involved stealing EMT clothes and using them to sneak back into the arena and just blend in until hopefully Scott Hall needed to be carried out on a stretcher. Probably did the same thing that he did to Jim Miller and Bill Barron's the two weeks prior. Yes. By the way, I also note in Jerry Jarrett's book, he says that this show fell far short of last week's show in so many areas. And noted that there were too many missed spots, too much profanity, and too much sexual content. He just flat out ignored the masturbate. I think everybody should have. Yes. So final rating, this, in my opinion, was easily the worst show out of five. Um, overall match quality averaged out at 2.71. 
Woof. Yeah. Uh, overall enjoyment, because like I say, you know, sometimes match quality doesn't always say whether or not you enjoy the show. The show could have bad matches and you just liked it. And the show could have good matches and you're just like, yeah, I didn't really care for it. I gave this a 2.0 out of 10 for overall enjoyment. Give it a 3. I think it was that was on the strength of the Loki versus AJ match and the Mouse versus Sapu rest. Yeah. Everything else was some of the worst wrestling I've seen. Four people out of there's seven matches. Four people won matches and then had to be taken out on a stretcher. So what the fuck did them winning even mean? And um, then yeah, they don't have to come to work next week. Yeah, because uh, you know, like we said, Jazz is not going to be here. Well, Sabu is going to be here. I I don't remember if Scott Hall's here next week. Um, uh, Scott Hall is not there next week. Uh, but Scott Hall, this is not the end of Scott Hall. He does return. Yeah. Nope, nope. Scott Hall still has a few more appearances to go. And uh, desire to buy next week's show. So based on the strength of this week's show. How much do I want to spend nine ninety five to watch next week's show? I gave it a one point five out of ten. Two. Yeah, literally, if I could watch a twenty minute edition, a twenty minute edition that has all the good matches and nothing else, I'd be all for it. But there were no good promos, two good matches, and ninety minutes of mind numbing crap. There was good promo. The truth one. Honestly, it's like. I was, I zoned out. So there was one good promo, and even that, I found a lot, enough stuff to bitch about. Because when you're in a bad mood watching a show, you don't always appreciate anything good. Yeah. And so, by the way, averaging out those three ratings give us gives us an overall rating for this show of a two point oh seven. This was bad. By the way, do you know how many pages and notes I had to write for this show? Five. Six, Sixteen. How the hell did you get six? What what size notebook are you using? I'm using Google Docs. And you got 16 pages out of it. Yes. And I just basically wrote what happened. Um, well, we got a lot out of this show, but a lot of it was talked about stuff that was kind of ancillary like you're t- we talked about that Jackie Gata match I talked about dumbass fans you know with signs trying to become memes so just... while the show was bad um I think this show is one of the best ones we've done so far oh yeah Th- this show is head and tails above you know the TNA show that we review you know, and I just want to say, if we have made this show sound entertaining in any way that makes you want to go watch this TNA show, don't. If you're find de- the Malice versus Sabu match, that's it. Sure, and if you're so desperate to give somebody ten dollars, I'll give you my PayPal account. Then just send it my way. But uh, so that's gonna do it for this week's show. Unless you have anything else you want to say, Cindy. Um. Yeah, uh, I am excited about a road trip that is happening. Ooh, tell us more. Um, Starting in Toronto on the 26th. Um, But to let everybody know, this is the 26th of July. Um, Don't worry, we have shows in the can already. We say that. We say that even though we technically have it. This is the July 17th show. Don't break the gimmick. (laughs) Um, but we have lots of episodes of the can. We tape well in advance. We're like TNA in 2017. Oh my god! If we tape three months of shows in one week, I think I'll be ready to kill you by the end of that week. <laughs> <laughs> um, <sighs> but I'm going to Toronto, Albany, Atlantic City, Washington D.C., uh, doing laundry in Whitville, Nashville, Atlanta. Uh, Jacksonville, Tampa Bay, Miami, two and a half weeks. Going to have a grand old time. Watch a lot of baseball. Watch Canadian football. Interesting. Yes, I might. I think I'm going to see the Argonauts. I might mm-hmm. see the bust of Elix Skipper in their Hall of Fame. Remember when he won those three Grey Cups in a row for him? Of course. I mean, 
you know, if you can't put the guy in the Toronto Argonauts Hall of Fame for winning the uh, Grey Cup three times, even though Lance Storm then had to explain to him what the Grey Cup was, and Lance Storm is not a sports fan. Oh, Lord. Uh, by the way, I, of all the places you're going, I've been to Atlanta, which is really nice downtown and really isn't the second you get out of downtown. I've been to Albany, which I really liked. And I went to D.C. as a sixth grade field trip. And I think out of all the cities you mentioned, that was it. Although I'm happy to hear you're doing your laundry um, your, during your trip. So what we're doing is we're visiting baseball stadiums. Our, both me and my friend uh, Jamie have a goal to visit all 30 major league stadiums. Now, while you're in Toronto for your Argonauts game, are you going to go to a Blue Jays game? Yep. Okay, good. We're okay. doing the Argonauts on Saturday, the Blue Jays on Sunday. I, I was going to question your sanity if uh, you were just going for Canadian football. Not that there's anything wrong with Canadian football, just, you know. Seems a little random. I have a friend who's well versed and loves spring football. So, so the you know, one that, per the one person who watched the UFL. Oh, the old UFL, yeah. Oh, so not even this year's UFL, but the uh, I don't even know who won, but the the Dwayne owns. Uh no, the Roughnecks did not win. Darn. Anyway, that's going to do it for this week's show. I want to thank everybody for listening. Hope you all enjoyed it. And we'll talk to you again in seven days. <laughs>